In this video, we are going to continue talking about the topics of Lab 2. Now we are going to be exploring the terms accuracy versus precision. As we learned in the last lab, accuracy and precision can be affected by experimental error. So when we talk about measurements, understand that accuracy means that the data that you obtain is compared to a goal. Understand that this term goal actually refers to the accepted value for a particular measurement. In this lab, you guys are going to be exploring how these terms relate to experiments regarding density. Accuracy measures the quantity to reality because remember that we are comparing measurements to an accepted value. Understand that if you are doing an experiment and you have several measurements, because you are comparing it to an accepted value, you can actually pinpoint which ones are bad results. And those are going to be the ones that are not close to the accepted value. In a way, you can determine if your measurement is accurate by doing it one time, but as a good practice. In the laboratory, we typically do things when we're face to face three times. One of the things is that if you look at only how accurate your measurement is, you don't know about the quality of those measurements. On the other hand, when we look at precision of your measurement, that determines how close the data is to each other. So if you have several measurements and you're comparing them to one another, then you can see, oh, my technique is good because <clears throat> those numbers are close to one another. Now, you can actually say your technique is even better if you can also make sure that those results are accurate. But we're going to talk about that more in a few moments. Understand that precision measures how well those measurements can be reproduced. So like I was mentioning, this can actually pinpoint if your technique is really, really good or there's some adjustments that need to be made. When it comes to looking at precision and measurements, understand that the bad results are going to be scattered. So it's not until we tie it to accuracy and we, in some cases, if the uh, lab permits, if we are going to look at it uh, and compare it to the true value that we can also see that it is accurate. Understand that in terms of a measurement being precise, it needs several measurements to determine. Because remember, you are comparing those measurements to one another. And if you're looking at the precision of your measurements, it actually speaks about the quality. Now, those two terms, precision and accuracy, can come together and they are important in experimental data because it actually, if you put them together, if you make sure that your measurements are close to one another, but they, in addition, are close to the accepted value, understand that it describes the placement of your data. It actually tells you um, if you have good technique because those measurements are close to one another, but even better if those measurements are close to the accepted value. In a way, they summarize the data. They determine the exactness of those measurements. Sometimes people think that precision and accuracy are the same thing. But even though they could, and sometimes they could understand that these terms are different from one another. One of the things that is the most important thing is that if you make sure that your results are not only precise, but also accurate, it can help you determine the successfulness of your results. And as we can see here, we can apply them to many science courses, including chemistry. Now, 
one of the ways in which we can actually look specifically at the accuracy of measurements is by calculating percent error. And as you can see, percent error is defined as the difference between estimated value and the actual value in comparison to the actual value. And this is expressed as a percent. As you can see, the equation for percent error is given in the following slide. We are going to be utilizing this equation to look at mathematically how we can uh, determine how accurate a particular measurement is. Understand that in terms of percent error, scientists try to achieve less than 3% because that is going to be acceptable error in measurements. In this lab, we are going to learn how to do measurements for different um, units. Now, one of the things that I need to point out is that when we're doing a measurement, they are composed of known digits estimated digits and then you have the unit of measurement. Those are going to be the components of a measurement and we're going to see this in practice mainly when we look at measuring length and when we measure volume. Understand that these measurements depending on what we're doing what is giving us is what is the resolution of that instrument that we are looking at. And in class, in lecture, we discuss what is the definition of resolution because those are going to be the digits that we can actually see from our instrument. Now, when it comes to measuring length, understand that they were ancient <clears throat> instruments to uh, measure length, as you can see, just by the foot, by the span of uh, the hand, by arm lengths. But now we have modern instruments that are standardized for measuring length. And some include like rulers, measuring tapes, and even a caliper. Now, understand that you need to know how to correctly express a measurement depending on the instrument that is given. Let's go through the example that we have here in the right side of the slide. We have a pencil and we have this pencil in a ruler that is measuring in centimeters. So based on that, we already know that the unit, let me use my highlighter tool, for my measurement is going to be centimeters. Let me select a different color because it's hard to see. Now, our markings in the ruler, those are going to be the known digits. So if we zoom in into this image and I do a dotted line to look at the tip of this object which is a pencil we can see that based on the known markings okay the known digits right now is going to be 9.5 because those we can see in the ruler so the known digits is going to be 9.5 again because that's what we see in the ruler Now, because in measurement, we always have an estimated digit, then we have to estimate a digit between 9.5 and 9.6. So that means that that estimation in this case, which is the uncertainty, needs to be to the second decimal place. So 
if you see that in this measurement, this is actually right at the line, then understand that your estimated digit is going to be a zero. A measurement of 9.51 can also be correct. 9.52 can also be correct because remember that that second digit, it is an estimate. And how correctly we make that estimate is that technically we're supposed to see 10 lines in between the two known digits and then that's how we determine the estimate. When it comes to measuring mass, understand that there's different devices that can be utilized for measuring mass in the laboratory. But the common equipment that we use for measuring mass is called a balance. You can see here three different types of balances that are known to be utilized in the laboratory. These are actually listed from left to right, from most expensive to least expensive. And pretty much what we have here is what is the difference between the price tags in these is going to be what digits you can get on the displays. As you can see in the first one, which is called an analytical balance, we see many digits on the screen compared to the middle one. And in the last one, we don't even have digits because in the last one we need to use like standard weights to actually compare the mass of what we're trying to measure to that standard weight the other two give you already the digits that are important in that resolution and since the first one has more digits it has a better resolution Typically, when it comes to the laboratory, you can see around the lab um, more often any of the first two. Another measurement that you guys need to know how to do is going to be volume. I just want to introduce at least the different glassware for volume. And in the laboratory, we can measure volume by utilizing a graduated cylinder. We can utilize syringes. We can utilize burettes. You can utilize a pipette and a volumetric flask. When it comes to measuring volume, understand that out of all of this glassware, the volumetric flask is going to be the best glassware for measuring volume. But commonly, we use the graduated cylinder, the burette, and the pipette. When we are measuring volume, specifically in the three that I did a check mark, we have to pay attention to the gradation that is present on the glassware. And we are going to read it based on the curvature that our liquid forms in that glassware. So that discussion leads to talk about the meniscus. As you can see, the meniscus is the curved surface of a liquid in a tube. So when you put liquid in a tube, it's going to form a curvature. Now, this curvature can either be concave, as you can see in letter A, and that's the most common one, or it can actually be convex, like in letter B. The typical example when we talk about convex is going to be mercury in glass. But what is the difference between the two? If it's concave, the curvature is pointing down. If it's convex, the curvature is pointing up. So let's say that we have a particular liquid in any of the glassware that I just introduced, a graduated cylinder a burette or a pipette and we need to deliver a particular amount of liquid and we need to make sure that we know how to read our instrument in order to deliver the correct amount of liquid. Well, let's take for example that this liquid is going to make a concave curvature when it's placed in the glassware. The correct way to measure the liquid volume that we have in that glassware is that the eye level
when you're looking at the curvature that the liquid forms in the glassware, that curvature, because if you have a concave curve, the bottom of the meniscus needs to be with the calibration mark. So again, when we are doing this experiment, when we're trying to read the meniscus, the eye level have to look at the bottom of the curvature and that bottom of the curvature is um, what we look at based on the calibration mark. That's how you determine the volume of a liquid. Lastly, in this lab, you guys are going to be doing or watching some labs about experiments on density. So the density of a sample is defined as its mass divided by its volume. It's given by the equation D equals M over V. So one of the things is that measuring the mass of a substance, because we have balances, is actually fairly easy. It doesn't matter if you have a solid or a liquid, taking its mass is fairly easy. Now, taking its volume can be tricky, especially if you have a solid that is irregular shape. Now, there is a technique that can be utilized in order to determine the volume of an irregular object. And that technique is volume by displacement. The way that volume by displacement works is that you're going to have a particular um, glassware that we utilize for measuring volume and you're going to put a set uh, amount of liquid in it. In this case, the initial volume, what we have on the left, let's say that this is 17.1 milliliters of water already placed in this graduated cylinder. Then you're going to put your irregular shape solid the final volume, let's say that it is 19.8 milliliters. So, because when you place that irregular shape solid in there, it displays a particular amount of volume that actually corresponds to the volume of that solid. So, this is how you calculate it. The actual volume of the object is obtained by subtracting 19.8 milliliters minus 17.1 milliliters. When we do this, 19.8 minus 17.1, that is 2.7 milliliters. So this volume that was displaced, which is basically the difference let me do here. So that volume that was displaced by the object is its volume. And in an experiment like this, if you're trying to determine the density, you will take the mass of your object, and you can see that is given here, 51.842 grams. And then you're going to divide it by 2.7 milliliters
So when you divide those two values, 51.842 divided by 2.7, You get a calculator displayed that says 19.2007474, but we need to express this with the correct number of sig figs since the top measurement has five, the bottom measurement has two, so you need to round this to two significant figures. So the density is going to be 19 grams per milliliter. And that's how we utilize the technique of volume by displacement to know the volume of an object. And this can help us determining the density of our object.